Thanks very much, Andy. Um, I just want to remind everybody of one of the comments made by one of the guest speakers on Monday afternoon regarding the chauffeur and the doctor and the speech that the chauffeur gave. So I think I'm going to take the, the chauffeur's talk here today and any hard questions can be referred to the doctors because some of them, are, some of my co-authors are sitting here um, in the audience today. When we started this whole process, we received a lot of criticism and we kind of bounced that off and everything like that. And, and in preparing for today, one of the things I actually came across was this quote from 1969, where it actually talks about what the standards of zoo should be about and how they should be judged. And it looks like in, even in 1969, the contemporary way of thinking was already starting to develop. And it kind of made me feel very justified in the, in the way we were going and stuff, because things have evolved and we've needed to evolve with that. And in 1969, they already were saying we need to start looking after animals more appropriately, having more contemporary way of, of managing them in zoos and, and giving them as much as a possible wild experience um, and not just a barren enclosure. Basically, just to talk about what I want to talk about is, is what the problem is, where we've got to, um, how we've managed to research the topic and get up to these minimum standards and, and present that to you um, as it is still in draft, but present to you how we've actually managed to get this and not as most people have thought. It's not been a thumb suck. There's actually been some uh, rigorous science behind the whole process. There have to be some acknowledgements, though. This is not just a couple of us that sat around. We've had some extensive consultation, both locally and nationally, with a number of experts, stakeholders, the public, um, KZN Wildlife staff, and the NGOs, the people involved in the industry, croc farmers, rehab, sanctuaries. And they've all been integral in this entire process. So we're not going to take all the kudos for what we present today. Um, there have been a lot of people that have been involved. Yesterday morning, we spent the whole day debating the rhino poaching, and a lot of people will say, well, what are you worried about, about animals in captivity and stuff like that? Mandy just said, that should be some other department. That's the NSPCA's problem. Why are conservation organizations um, worried about animals in captivity? And hopefully, we can say it is our problem because, A, we mandated to look after it in the law, and B, we're the ones that have to enforce the law because we're permitting these animals in captivity. So some of the problems that we've come up with is the inconsistency, not only in the enforcement. People down in Durban might get told a two-by-two two meter enclosure to keep a certain bird is fine. You come up to the Richmond area and people in the audience will know it's got to be a lot bigger than that because I feel and I look at it slightly different to one of my counterparts. So there's an inconsistency in the way we enforce the legislation. And then there's different husbandry techniques. Something somebody does in a certain part of the country is very different to how somebody else does it. So there's inconsistency a way the people in the industry actually do things. Um, and then there's obviously the, the, the usual biodiversity and welfare concerns, the husbandry, hybridization, stereotypical behavior, poor conditions being found. So these are all some of the issues that, and problems that are manifesting themselves out there. And then there's the range of stakeholders with differing opinions and personalities that we actually have to engage with. Some people very friendly, others threaten your life, throw things at you, don't let you in the front door. So these are kind of all that have led to this problem that we kind of sit with now. <clears throat> and these are some of the range of standards that we're getting. Things locked in night enclosures for years on end, never seeing the sunlight, never getting out. And then on the other side, access to an open space, flowing water, um, environmental enrichment, things to climb. So these are the kind of the dis discrepancies that we're picking up. And then there's the usual locked in uh, transport enclosures, um, no environmental enrichment, primate species that want to be enriched, that want to have things to climb, to play with, just a barren enclosure, and then just the usual filth, dirt, lack of clean water, lack of adequate food. So these are kind of all the things that we're picking up that makes our life very difficult as the conservation organization. And so where do we sit? Well, we sit with on the one end of the spectrum, you've got the people that are purely self-interested, the people that want to keep animals as pets. And then on the other side, 
We've got the animal rights groups, the people that don't want to see any animals in captivity whatsoever. And we've got to find that, that middle ground where we, we meet the, re, the responsible industry, the animal welfare authorities, where we kind of find and, and say, right, well, this is where we prepare to sit. And that's where we sit, and that's where our responsibility comes in as KZN Wildlife. And that middle is, is governed by societal norms, um, reasonable, transparent um, norms and standards, which are hopefully based on facts and knowledge, contemporary thinking, which will find that middle ground and doesn't skew between the, the, the purists on the one side, the animal rightists, and the self-centered uh, keeping pets in captivity on the other side. So what is our legal mandate? Obviously, it's defined by some outdated legislation, unfortunately, the Ordinance 15 of 1974, where it talks about cage design and enclosure being at the opinion of the inspecting officer. Now, that gives the inspecting officer a very wide range because your opinion today can vary from your opinion in two weeks' time once you've read something or somebody has influenced your opinion. Um, it talks about cleanliness, food, and water provisions. <clears throat> and it's left very much to the officer to determine those satisfactory conditions. We also, our mandate's determined by the TOPS legislation, which is unfortunately very mum on standards for keeping animals in captivity. And then there's the KwaZulu Natal Management Act, <coughs> excuse me, 9 of 1997, where it's quite specific, where it says the board, the, our, our case in board, must determine conditions and set norms and standards. So it's not saying you may, it actually says you must. So it actually, we are obliged and mandated to set these norms and standards and, and, and conditions for the import, export, and utilization of indigenous and non-indigenous wild plants and animals. So it's not just about the indigenous species, but it's about all species. However, as we currently stand, no such norms and standards exist. And then the officers themselves set the varying standards, which is often to the detriment of the applicant as well as animal welfare. So going back, we had to start saying, well, how do we actually understand this topic? And we kind of went out there to say, right, let's go out and research it. And we went to look at international standards. Are there national and international standards and guidelines, starting to see what's been done throughout the world. We then went and consulted experts um, in first world, second world, third world, fourth world countries. So we got the range of, of standards for zoos, rehab facilities, sanctuaries, and said, how are you doing this overseas? What are you doing? What are you doing locally? How are you doing it? How are you managing it? We then held a range of key, whole, key stakeholder discussions and workshops. So saying, right, guys, there's no, what, what are you doing? How are you doing it? What are you, how are you managing these things? We then asked the public to, to participate. We kind of put a straw dog, a, a draft out there for comment and said, please give us your comment. We want your comment. We want to incorporate this. And then we also went and visited captive facilities in other provinces. So we kind of went on a jolly patrol around the country to say, how's it been done elsewhere? Are there benchmarks in our own country that we can actually look at and use that as a, as, as a guide? And so what did we find? Internationally and nationally, there's definitely been a progression towards a more modern standard. See, and, and there's been significant improvements. We're not living in the era where animals were just in a cage for people to go and see and walk on. Right, that's a tiger, move on, that's an elephant, that's a lion. Things have changed. There's increased enclosure sizes. So it's not that Victorian little two-by-two two enclosure anymore. Things have evolved. Bigger enclosures, prov providing more naturalized habitat. So the animal, where you see an animal and the experience you are, are receiving as a visitor is a more naturalized environment. You can now depict what that animal would occur like in the wild with and it's used to enhance that visitor experience and also support their natural behavior. So the animals in captivity are able to do, to a certain degree, what they'd be able to do in the wild with a lot of emphasis on environmental enrichment. We take one example as the tiger. In the 1960s, small barren enclosures, the animal just kind of had a little area to move around. Where we've moved to now more modern design, natural vegetation, ponds, places where tigers can swim, get out, sun themselves, and have a more natural experience, as well as the, the, the visitor being able to enact a lot more than just seeing bars. They have now glass to look through and, and, and experience. In South Africa, they're very, or no, no standards, maybe a sum for keeping crocodiles in captivity. 
And then there's governed by the SANS standards. But those are not regulatory and they're not specific enough. They're kind of, you may do this, this would be nice. So they're not really descriptive enough. And there's no effective self-regulation. Um, there might be amongst the falconry, there's, no there's the falconry clubs that are very strict in controlling their members. But all in all, the industry is not very good at self-regulation. We have PayZab and it has a whole lot of members, but they don't control and manage their members as well as they should. And then the majority of species regulated in captivity are birds and mammals. So that's kind of where we said, well, let's start off with that. What are the main things being kept in? So what did we need? We needed to adopt this modern approach. We've seen internationally that that's the way to go. We've got to be contemporary in the way we do things. And that's how we needed to start. Accept, start a new modern approach and set reasonable and appropriate standards. Not things that are pie in the sky stuff because that would be getting to a point where you'd almost be making it unattainable and then people would be accusing of us of wanting to stop keeping animals in captivity altogether. So we wanted to set those reasonable and appropriate standards. And then identifying what the needs of these animals are in captivity based upon their characteristics. So what is, the, what is the animal we're dealing with? What are its characteristics? And then how do we set the standard for that? And then ultimately develop these minimum requirements for keeping animals in captivity and determine the standard conditions which would then get onto permits. And as Mandy was saying, hopefully that then can evolve into all the provinces so people know the conditions are the same no matter where you go. So what are the reasons for keeping animals in captivity? The main ones, to just speak to the public, sanctuaries, rehab, research, commercial breeding, pets in the trade, and falconry. So our first step was basically to identify the animal's needs based on the characteristics. There being social requirements, furnishings and enrichments, and enclosure sizes. With the basic premise and principle being, a bird is a bird is a bird. It doesn't matter for what you're using that animal, the needs still need to be the same. So some of the key factors that we used in setting standards was the basically basic husbandry needs, needs needed to be provided. Water, food, and social needs. And then there was the size and enclosure, which would be influenced by the size and nature of the animal. The design, which would be influenced by the height and locomotory behavior of the animal. So that would be the space and shape. And then what furnishings would be required to ensure that the basic needs are being met, such as shelter, shelter as well as the behavioral traits. Just to, looking at space and design, as we can see, some of the key things are being discussed internationally is that it, space is required for the locomotory nature, so climbing, flying. So what is the species doing in that? How is it using that space? What is its natural behavior? And then how is it appropriate social in, environment, so nest building and, and, and the likes. And a lot of the times, less space actually leads to more agonistic behavior. So a lot more aggression can occur if there's less space because animals can't re retreat from one another. And the natural history is the best predictor of space requirements than any other variable. So that's what's being said internationally. So the basic premise that we worked on, the basic rule, would be obviously that you had your animal size versus your enclosure size. And as your animal size increases, so your enclosure size should increase. And hopefully there should be some kind of linear relationship. So the smaller animals, we need a smaller enclosure. And bigger animals, we need a bigger enclosure. So that was our basic rule as a starting point. The next step was what we then would determine what was a reasonable, for, for reasonable um, sizes for a subset of animals covering the broad range of uh, birds and mammals, looking at literature, international guidelines, facility benchmarking. So we came up with a subset of enclosure sizes, which we then sent to a number of experts and said, can you look at these? Take in, in your, your, your expertise, your history, your, where you are, and kind of moderate them. And they then sent back things and said, right, we kind of moderated them on that and looked at, and we said, separated them into the mammals. Um, and then in the mammals, we thought, well, there's different types of mammals with different behavioral repertoires. So we looked at ungulates, primates, um, and carnivores. And basically from there, um, there, uh, the experts looking at this, you can see a lot of the relationships with the enclosure sizes um, have a fairly good uh, relationship. And then we looked at the birds. The birds were slightly different because you have the way the birds actually use the enclosure. You have ground dwellers, so we then started looking at splitting that into ground dwellers as opposed to aerial birds such as raptors. So we then kind of broke that down a little bit more. 
we then applied this relationship that we've the weight length, the weight of, or length of the, the species as opposed to space for each of the species that we kind of know or expect to occur in captivity, and then moderated that looking at um, the behavior, the locomotory attributes, the social nature and groupings, and what furnishing requirements are to basically look at something that would then look at something like this. So we look at the bird size. As the bird gets bigger, you would expect the area to increase. But for certain species, you have your ground dwellers, so they would obviously make use more of the ground. So they would require a bigger enclosure size as opposed to your aerial species, which make use more of the space, the height of the enclosure. So they could then have a smaller one, and then that was then moderated. And so basically at the end of the outcome is looking at a, a graph relationship where you, you, you look at the body mass or length depending on the species opposed to the space. And we just took two examples is the cheetah and does this point to work? You're basically looking at a cheetah weighing at about 65 kgs would require approximately 900 square meters. But obviously, we're not wanting one cheetah in an enclosure. We'd prefer them to be in pairs. So we then moderated that to look at about 1,500 square meters for two cheetahs. And the same with lion. Is one lion would require 1,000 square meters, but obviously, we're wanting them to occur in groups, so they weight. So you'd look closer to just short of 2,000 square meters for a group of lions. And then that was then extrapolated for all the species. And this, this would, our ultimate uh, end product is what would occur on the permit condition is that we're then saying, right, if you had a dwarf mongoose, we would prefer that you would want four animals in enclosure of 60 square meters. The height is not a, an issue because, um, and then any th additional space animal that you would require, you would require an additional 15 square meters. And then we getting to a point where this is coming into the, the, the conditions of in environmental enrichment, the design, how it should look, but basically the size, and then this is done and would appear on your permit condition and saying if you want to keep these animals, this is the kind of space that you require for that many amount of animals. So where to now? We know our mandate is clear. We know we've got to look at uh, permit and manage animals in captivity. We know our, our enforcement needs to have a single standard for the benefit of the keepers as well as for enforcement agencies, and we need consistent implementation. And why do we need to do this? Because we are told we may issue a permit and we may not issue, and you may not possess an animal without a permit. So when the question we're asking is when do you issue a permit and when don't you issue a permit? And hopefully through this establishment of these uh, enclosure sizes, we will then know when we issue a permit and when we don't issue a permit. And we're also told that we may impose conditions, reasonable permit conditions, and when an animal must be kept in satisfactory conditions. So what are these conditions? For which species? For what type of centers? And through this process, we'll get there that we'll then know for this type of center, you will have these conditions. And for this is the size that you need. So it will be clearer for not only for us as enforcement agencies, but also for the people that are wanting to keep these animals in captivity. Thank you.